Okay, so let's um, see how to do that paper space stuff that we did in the last session, but from scratch, like step by step. Um, and one very reasonable comment on the forum after yesterday's session was like, this all seems kind of complicated. Um, and it is. Um, and like, definitely one option is like, don't worry about it for now. Um, but I would say like, trying to get this working is a pretty good exercise, actually. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it's totally up to you. But I, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's probably worth, worth trying to get working and ask lots of questions about anything that you're not sure if it doesn't make sense or it doesn't work for you or whatever. Um, okay, so if I say share screen, here we go, share portion of screen. I've never tried this before, anything could happen. Share, move that, put it there. This is cool. Okay, do you see my browser window? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, I'm successfully sharing a portion of the screen. Um, paper space. So what I did this morning was I just went in and moved all of my paper space set up in persistent storage out of the way so that when I create a notebook, um, it's going to be totally empty. So let's create a notebook. How did you move it out of the way, Jeremy? They're using the admin options. Uh, I, I, oh, no, I mean, I just like, I went into slash storage and moved the files, re renamed them to give them a like .bak extension or whatever, so they wouldn't be run and moved everything into a different uh -huh. order. That's all. So okay. you now have the setup that we would all see, right? That, that's the idea. Like yeah, exactly. This, should, this should look like okay. what you should all see. Right. So I'm going to delete the workspace URL. So we have something totally empty, which I think is actually probably best. Um, right. And yeah, so follow along if you want. Um, and if anything doesn't work for you, let me know. Um, and then what I thought we would do is um, I like to learn as few things as possible um, because I'm lazy. And so the way to get away with being lazy and learning as few things as possible is to um, learn things which are really versatile and powerful so that they can like do a lot of things. So in particular, I haven't really spent the time to learn bash scripting very well. Um, I know it a little bit um, because I have instead spent the time to learn to use Python as an effective scripting language. And I can also use Python for machine learning. I can also use Python for creating web services. I can also use um, Python for creating console applications. I can, you know, use Python for creating continuous integration scripts, etc. So that way I, I can be lazy and I like being lazy. Um, it's one of Larry Wall's three virtues of a great programmer is laziness along with impatience and hubris. Um, and I would like to be a great programmer. So I follow those principles. Um, so let's try to use Python to, to kind of automate the things we want to do. So remember that um, I, you know, we're going to avoid using the weird proprietary GUI because we're lazy. We don't want to learn it. And also because it's not that good. So I'm just going to um, open up a second tab. Um, and so over here, I'll click JupyterLab. And so what we should find is that we're in a totally empty spot. Here we go. So um, this morning I did do some reading of documentation, which is also a great thing to do if you're lazy, because if you read documentation, then you can like find out straight away how things work rather than spending ages trying to figure it out. And so the documentation for paper space um, 
was actually very useful and it um, it explained how their different folders work exactly. Um, so in the root directory, um, this would probably be a bit bigger, I think. There we go. Um, actually, I think if I go view presentation mode or something, it makes it a bit bigger anyway. That didn't do anything at all. <laughs> okay. Um, in the root directory, there's a couple of particularly interesting folders. Most of the folders you see here are the same that you would find in any Linux box, but the notebooks and storage folders are interesting. And one of the ways we know they're interesting is if I go df minus h, which you might remember is disk free, it lists all the mounted disks uh, in human form. Um, it's made it way too wide, so we can't really read it. Yeah, never mind. Um, Okay, I'll make it smaller just for the purpose of showing you this. Um, so the uh, slash notebooks is actually on a whole separate 500 gigabyte disk and slash storage is on a whole separate 500 gigabyte disk. Um, the, uh, so what paper space does is slash storage, anything I put in there is gonna be seen by every single notebook server I create. And in fact, if you've got, I think if you've got like multiple people in the organization, they might see the same thing as well. Um, so that's going to be shared across, um, yeah, all any notebook server I create. That's um, that's going to be handy because anything I want to use on every one of my servers, if I put it in there, then I don't have, you know, I don't have to worry about recreating it each time. Um, something we didn't mention last time is slash notebooks is interesting. That's also persistent storage, but it's persistent storage just for this one server. Um, so stuff that's in there, we will see every time we start up this server. If we delete this server, it's it's gone, unless we back it up. Um, so that's where we would put things that we don't want on every server, but just on, just on this one. Um, you pay for storage. Um, and you pay, I think it's like 30 cents a gigabyte or something like that per month. Um, and they don't limit you, you know, except for the 500 gig limit. So it's up to you to be careful of that. Um, you will find in your account, there's a section that's called billing that shows you how much storage you're using. Um, so it, they will add up stuff in slash storage that just appears once and every single one of your notebook servers slash notebooks that will all be added together. Okay, um, so the first thing we did last time um, was we tried installing something extra from PIP. Um, so one conversation that we had on the forum since then is like, are you sure that's not gonna mess me up? Because um, uh, you know, paper spaces installed stuff, I believe using Conda um, and PIP and Conda are different things for installing Python libraries. Um, so, you know, is that gonna mess things up? And the, the official answer is yes, it will, don't do it. Um, but the unofficial answer is you know, we've got tens of thousands of people on our forums and I've never heard of anybody in practice actually having any problem with using both pip and conda slash member. So I'm just gonna say, don't worry about it. Um, it um, yeah, as we said yesterday, I think the only, the place you really need to use conda or mamba is, is for stuff that uses the GPU um, and particularly for PyTorch or if heaven forbid you have to use TensorFlow. Um, um, yeah, so I'm going to say, don't worry about it. And and the reason we um, we actually want to use pip in this particular case is we want to be able to install the packages into a into our home directory into a different place. Um, Jeremy, yeah. The reason the reason we want to use uh, Mamba or Conda for stuff that requires the GPU is that they have a way of installing dependencies, right? Like, uh, yeah, uh, they, they have a way of installing the, uh, the, the CUDA toolkit requirements. So we don't have to install the CUDA SDK. 
um, is basically the reason. And that's, um, and, and it's not just like one less thing to install, but more importantly, it's one less thing to maintain. Like you don't, like, your CUDA version and your PyTorch version have to the mesh correctly, otherwise it'll break. And if you just use Conda, that happens automatically. But if you use PIP, then it's up to you to make sure you're installing the correct meshing versions of each things. Um, it's also more challenging in a something like paper space because, you know, installing things like the, the CUDA SDK into your home directory is, I don't even know how you would do it without using Conda, frankly. Yep. Does that answer your question, Radek? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, so somebody's got a loud clicky keyboard. They should probably mute themselves. Um, Jeremy. Yes. Hi. Hi. If, if the PIP installation uh, do something wrong, uh, can I uninstall or get to a, to yeah, a previous state? Yeah, I mean, kind of. You can always just type pip uninstall um, or just delete your MambaForge directory and start again. Um, but, you know, people always like, I mean, or you can just, you know, install a Conda package over the top of it. Like it, it shouldn't really be an issue, generally speaking. Um, the issue tends to be more if you accidentally install something into your system Python. Um, yeah, but the idea is that you want to feel like you can blow away your Mamba Forge or Mini Conda or whatever directory anytime and recreate it. Um, yeah, because you don't want to be in a situation where things work, but you don't know why they work. And you don't know if you can get them back to a working state again. That's really unsustainable. Um, but yeah, well, the short I'm answer is you can just type pip uninstall to remove a, a module. Uh, thank you. What about when, when it says that some packages are going to be downgraded? That's OK. Yeah. That's okay if it's going to downgrade packages. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of check how much it's being downgraded, but sometimes it'll be like one or two, you know, you know, 0 0.02, 0 0.0.02 difference in version or something. It's not going to matter. I mean, if it's downloading it, downgrading it by a lot, that might mean that something wrong is happening. Um, but yeah, it's not necessarily a problem. Uh, okay, so, and I think like PIP almost never downgrades things. Conda does sometimes. Um, so let's try, um, so the thing we learned yesterday is we can go PIP install, and if you want to upgrade something, it's minus U. And there was this one extra thing we typed, which was minus minus user. And so, so the key thing that does is it puts it into our home directory. Um, and so in our home directory, the place it put it is the dot local <clears throat> folder. Um, so what the so the thing we wanted to do was to make sure that the next time we start up our computer, we want that that dot local um, to be there. Um, so that means we have to move it to persistent storage. So that's easy enough to do by using move. So we can move it into our persistent storage. Um, and you know what I would be inclined to do actually is to create a folder in there just for the stuff that we're where you, the things in storage that we're using specifically for like configuration like this. So um, I was just about to delete this line when I realized I haven't taught you folks how to delete lines yet. So to delete the um, everything left of the cursor, it's control U. And to delete everything right of the cursor, it's control K. So I hit control U. Um, and so let's create a directory for this. So we'll go make a directory 
in slash storage, which we'll call like, I don't know, CFG for our configuration stuff. Okay, and so then we'll make a sim link from, oh, so then we're gonna move. Okay, so we're gonna move our dot local folder into there. Now, do you remember the way to say the last thing I typed on the last line is, um, is exclamation mark dollar. So I can say move.local to slash storage slash config by doing move.local and then exclamation mark dollar. And, and you can see it's filtered out here to show me. So that's a quick shortcut. And then, so I want to sim link that back again into this directory. So create a sim link from slash storage config dot local to here. And here is the default, right? So I don't have to say to here. And so you can see we've now got something called dot local. And it's not a real normal folder, it's just a pointer to this other place but I, it acts like a normal folder, as you can see. And so that should mean that I can import fast core and get fast core dot version should be one, four, three. Control D twice to exit. Okay. Everybody happy with that so far? Uh, Jeremy, I had a doubt. So which path yeah. where was the dot local actually there? Like uh, in which folder was dot so local? So the dot local is in my home directory. And so okay. see how here I typed CD. So CD takes you back to your home directory and you can tell where I am because it's the bit before the pound sign and tilde means in my home directory. Got it. And basically everything it creates for like kind of your configuration will be somewhere in your home directory. Just on that, um, while we're talking about it, Jeremy, I noticed that when doing CD backslash, not CD space backslash. I probably mean CD space forward slash. Forward slash, slash. Mm -hmm. yeah, that one. Um, that went to a different place to the home where it goes CD space tilde. Yeah, so CD, space slash takes you to the root directory. Okay, so that's the top level where I'll CD enter or CD tilde, same thing, takes you to your home directory. So if I go to CD slash and I type print working directory, it says, oh, you're in slash. And if I just type CD and say print working directory, it says, oh, you're, you're in your home. And since we're root, that's our home. Normally the home directory is slash home slash username roots a special case. Does that answer Thank that you. question? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick question, Jeremy, yeah. like in terms of starting your, um, the instance that you just started, is that uh, without an image, right? Uh, I used the fast AI image, um, okay. but I used the trick that we learned yesterday, which is to go to advanced and then delete the contents of the Git workspace. So oh, okay. I clicked on create. I clicked on fast AI. Make sure you do choose the fast AI image because it's got all the stuff we need to make this stuff work. But I then clicked advanced options and then deleted that. And the only impact of that is it just, it doesn't put the contents of this Git repo into your notebooks directory. That's the only thing. That's the Okay. Only so I could try all these things that you're doing right now without, because I do have a notebook already created, but it's with the fastbook document. Yeah, so you could like just delete them, you know? Uh, okay. you know, just uh, rm star dot ipnb or or just ignore them or yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. cool. Thank you. No worries. Um, but Jeremy, can I ask one more question? Anytime. Um, the uh, so now you've you've the dot local that you've created. Now let's say you uh, so it's on your storage, so it's mm -hmm. persistent. Mm -hmm. Now you reboot the system and you don't download another you pip install something else mm -hmm. and you move that new dot local that it's going to create, isn't that going to overwrite what's in your storage? Yeah, so we haven't got to that bit yet. So we're at this point, okay. we've got something that's working just for this instance, but it's not going to work for a future one. So we need to, um, we need to, what we're going to do 
um, Mark, is we're going to create a little Python script that um, that is before it starts the server, before it starts Jupyter in the server, it sim links, it creates this sim link. And then in the future, if I type pip install minus minus user, it'll store it in dot local slash blah, but dot local will already be pointing at slash storage. So it'll actually nice. stick it in slash storage. And that's that's the secret trick. I got it. Okay, thank you. Cool. And Mark, I think you were the one who said on the forum about like, are we sure this is a good idea? Was that was that you? And yeah, that's me. Yeah. I, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to make it all about me. But I've had so many. I've, I've started well, I want to make it about you because, like, the, you, you're at my target demographic here is people who aren't particularly confident <laughs> at the shell. The so, common denominator. <laughs> but, no, no, not at all. It's just um, you're the one person who was brave enough to join in. I think, despite having less um, experience at the terminal, so I actually want you to be particularly happy to interrupt any time something's not clear. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I've, I've started this course a few times and every time the problem is always, the thing that always makes me stop is this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I end up like getting conflicts. And I remember there was an old version of, I think it was paper space. I can't remember that you were recommending and it kept crashing and I kept losing work. And yeah. so I guess I'm a little paranoid about yeah. creating things that are going to create problems. Yeah. So, to, so to be clear, Mark, I don't feel like we've had a great solution for running fast AI cheaply and easily until now. So the reason you've had problems before is that like there wasn't a great solution before. So so this is the first time I'm actually saying to you, I really do think this is going to work. And so anytime <laughs> something goes wrong, like feel free to like share your screen or anything because that debugging process will also be useful. So I'd say for now, you know, suspend disbelief, give it a go. And you know, if it all falls apart, blame me and I will happily fix it. Um, and same right. goes for anybody. Um, as long as you're roughly following along with these steps, if you do something totally different, <laughs> maybe I won't be so patient. Um, okay, so, so look at what we did here. We did two things. We first of all moved our dot local to slash storage and then we sim linked it back. Now we're not gonna have to do that move ever again, right? We, that, that was just enough to kind of create a dot local, a, sl a slash storage slash config dot local. So all we need to do next time we, um, next time we uh, create an instance is to create the sim link, um, like so. So um, let's do it like, for something so simple, because I said I'm going to show you how I would do things, for something so simple, I would actually create a bash script for this. Um, and this is where things are going to get particularly interesting. Because um, well, okay, I'm going to show you the proper way to do this. And I'm also going to show you the slightly improper way to do this. Um, I'm going to show you how to use Vim. Um, which is actually a highly recommended editor that works in your terminal. But I'm also going to show you a trick for how you can use the Jupyter text editor. So Jupyter has an in-browser text editor, um, which currently we can't really use because it's it's pointing at slash notebooks. Um, so how would we change stuff? Well, how would we edit stuff that's in slash storage? Um, but what we could do is if we CD to slash notebooks, and then we create a sim link from Excuse slash me, storage. Yeah. Um, just letting you know on my screen at least, uh, your cursor is just cut off from the bottom of the screen. Okay. So, so like I need to like make the uh, browser a little bit smaller. smaller. Sounds like Jupyter is not quite showing this properly. Yep. So you can That's see it good. now? Cool. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so if I sim link slash storage into slash notebooks, um, then what should happen, there we go, is it appears here because this is showing me the contents of slash notebooks. So um, that would be one simple way to um, create a script here would be I could click plus and I could click text file. 
and we've got a text file. And so now we could um, copy and paste our sim link. So maybe copy, no, let's see, copy. Oh, that's annoying. That's very annoying. Can't copy stuff from the terminal. Wow, you're a rotten scoundrel. I just did it with control C and control V. Yeah, I, oh, it's because I'm on a Mac now. I have to press command, not control. Ha ha ha, right, thank you. Okay, um, and um, you need to make sure you're in your home directory for this to work, so CD, okay. Um, and to run this as a script, you have to tell it it's a script. Um, and the reason why it doesn't matter too much, but the official, the, 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 the kind of correct way to do that is to, you first of all say hash bang. That means the first line of a file in Linux and Mac tells it what program to run it with. And we want to run it with bash and you're meant to do it like this for slightly obscure reasons. Um, slash user slash bin slash env bash. That will run this script with bash. Um, okay, file save. Um, the slightly less correct way to do it is you could just say which bash to find out where bash is and it's actually slash bin slash bash. And you know, you can also type this, that would also work. So that says when to, to Linux or Mac, when you run this file, run it using this program. Sorry, run it using this program. Okay, so file save. All right, so let's rename that. And so in um, paper space, um, the special file called prerun.sh is run when it starts a new instance. Now, you might remember that, you know, um, in fact, let's, let's, it's good to, before you just go ahead and start an instance, let's try to like run it and see if it works. So if I type dot slash prerun dot sh and press enter, it doesn't work. And so the reason why it doesn't work, hopefully you're starting to remember now is that we need um, ex, uh, we need permissions to be set correctly. And in particular, we're missing the X here, the execute permission. Um, and so in the past lessons I've shown you, you can type chmod u plus X to add the execute permission to a file. Like so. Um, but I also actually kind of lied. I don't normally use that way of setting permissions. Normally I set all the permissions at once. Um, I would actually normally type this. I would uh, 755-prerun.sh. Now let me explain why 755. Um, and the reason I did it the other way before is it required less explanation. Um, 755 is not the number 755. It's actually three separate numbers, the number seven, the number five, and the number five. It says these are permissions for the user. These are permissions for the group. These are permissions for everybody. And then um, uh, the permissions, oh, just a moment. Um, so uh, actually it's not quite 555 that I want, but that's okay. Um, 
So basically for each one, it's going to add up three numbers, a one, a two, and a five. A one if it's executable, a two if it's writable, and a four if it's readable. So seven means readable and writable and executable for the user. Four means readable for the group. And then this four means readable for everybody. Um, so if I check this now, you can see it's got, okay, so this RWX is four plus two plus one equals seven. R dash dash, that's four plus zero plus zero. R dash dash four plus zero plus zero. So this these permissions are seven, four, four. Um, so that's, yeah, slightly weird. If you've done stuff with bit flags in your programming before, it'll look pretty familiar. And then if you haven't, it might look weird. Um, this kind of thing does come up quite a lot actually in programming a surprising amount. So um, it's probably worth getting familiar with the idea of bit flags. Uh, so that now should um, be able to be runnable. And it is now runnable. And so it's good we ran it because it tells us that, oh, you can't create a symbolic link because it already exists. Now, um, I'm not sure before Jupyter starts, if this directory will be here or not. Um, so it would probably be a good idea to assume it does. Um, so to avoid that, we could first of all go remove recursively and forcefully the any dot local directory or file that exists. Um, and so if I now save that and try to run it again, okay, it's worked. So that's good. So we should now be able to create a new notebook. And I will, I'm not really doing anything with the GPU at the moment, so I'm not gonna spend their money unnecessarily. So let's just create teeny tiny little instance here. Backspace, start. There we go. Um, Okay, so that's uh, gonna go ahead and start. So that's um, that's done that bit from scratch. Um, so let's now do our, our keys from scratch as well. Um, so, and you know, I would probably not do that SSH key gen thing in real life. So let's, let's do it all the way I would do it. So I would just say make dir.ssh, that's where our keys are gonna go, okay. Um, and then upload my keys. Whoops. Okay, there they are. Um, and so then that's cd to dot ssh and move. I put them in storage. So, so storage ID RSA star into here. Whoops. Oh crap. I just messed that up. Now I'm gonna have to upload them again. Sorry. Open. Overwrite. Um, move them into here. Okay, so there they are. Um, in fact, let's do LA because that tells us dot, which is the permissions on this directory. Okay, so the dot SSH directory, nobody else should be able to access it. So if I go chmod 700, 700, that means four plus two plus one. So all permissions for me, the user, and no permissions for anybody else on the directory. Okay, and then um, actually, 
well. And then for the ID RSA, it's just readable and writable, so 600 for my private key. And then for the public key, it's readable and writable by me, but only readable by everybody else. So there we've got it, okay? So this is what 700 permissions look like. This is what 600 permissions look like. And this is what 644 permissions look like. And after a while, actually you start getting used to the idea of like, oh, 644, anything that you can read and write and other people can read, you know, 700, any directory that you can fully access, 600, anything that only you can read and write. They kind of become like standard little concepts in your head. Um, so at that point, we should be able to test this now by SSHing to the username git at github.com. And I've successfully authenticated. Now, if that doesn't work for you, it's almost always because of permissions, but you can get a lot more information by running SSH verbosely by typing minus V. And it's quite cute. The more Vs you type, the more verbose it is. So very, very, very verbose. Um, okay, and it'll tell you all the stuff it's doing. Um, and so now we've done that, hopefully you won't be too surprised to hear that we want to do exactly the same thing with our .ssh folder, which is we want to move it into our persistent storage and then link it back again. So move .ssh into slash storage config and then sim link it back again. Now, rather than manually doing that, we could just go into our script and copy and paste these two lines. Okay, and do it for our SSH folder as well. So save that. And so if I run that script now, you can see my SSH is now sim linked. And if I test it, so I pressed Control R git gets me back the last thing I typed with git in it. Yep, it still works. Okay. And this notebook is hopefully finished starting. Yes, it has. Um, and I'm just going to quickly use the paper space IDE just because I'm testing and we can test. Yep, so this is a brand new instance I started in another tab and my dot local has successfully appeared there. So we can see that our pre-launch thingy is working. Okay. I think that's everything that I wanted to show today. Does anybody have any questions before I go? Sorry about the slow start. One quick question, yeah. um, Jeremy. Uh, You've, you can see a file structure there on the left-hand side. Um, I, I see just nothing that's- Yeah, so this is my old- I, Yeah, so my persistent storage already had stuff in it. So I've just been deleting stuff. Okay. And the reason we see storage is because of that sim link I created earlier. Um, so if I type history pipe grep, uh, when you start the instance, it is, uh, uh, when you open your left hand tab, you will be looking at your notebooks directory. Exactly, that is your notebooks directory. And so you might have missed it, but earlier on, what I did was I sim linked my uh, slash storage directory into my notebooks directory so that I could edit. Yeah, and okay. so if you missed, missed that. that bit, just watch the video and you'll see it happen. Um, um, but yeah, it was, this is this line here, ln minus s slash storage, and I put it into notebooks. 
Great, thank you. Um, not... but otherwise, I was going to have to show you how to use Vim, but I might show you how to use Vim next time. But this way, we can use our our editor. Great. And the the thing that makes it work across new servers is that the pre-run file is in the uh, storage. Um, drive. the pre-run file is is special. Um, so you might have noticed that when you go to the advanced options when you start the instance it says what program should it run when it starts and it's by default it runs a program called run.sh and if you look at that run.sh it says here run the pre-run.sh so that it, it has to be that exact place and that exact name it's a special file this is a paper space specific thing okay so, so as long as pre-run is in storage with that exact format, it will be across servers. Exactly right. Yeah, it'll be across servers because it's in slash storage and it will be run because the run.sh file runs it um, as, you know, um, yeah, exactly. So Jeremy, just a quick question about pre-run. Did, mm. did you created that, right? I it created the pre-run.sh file. It was not there, okay. yeah. So in bash, this if here actually says if, minus f is this file exists, then run it. That's what that bash means. And so paper space, uh, you know, I said to paper space, could you please add that to our, to our image? And so everybody who uses the, the, the fast AI image will, will have this. And so if you create a pre-run.sh in here, then it's going to run it. Right, so we would be creating that. It won't be pre- Correct, the way before. I created it, and again, go back and watch the video if you if you missed this and you wanna see it again. I double clicked on storage, and then I clicked on plus, and I clicked on text file. And then that created a text file called untitled.txt, which I then right clicked on, and I said rename, and I renamed it to prerun.sh. Right, and there was one this. before. Like I saw the dot back, so I guess- that's the dot back already... one, yeah, don't worry. That, that's, so okay. that's the one I moved out of the way. That's my actual right, right. Okay. one that I worked okay. for myself. Because I saw I that just... already and I was like, okay, did it? Did the system create it for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, no, that was just me okay. trying to get mine out of the way so it didn't um, okay. no make me cheat. All right, so then the last step, of course, we have to do is to stop our server. Um, <laughs> Tell me one quick question. Yeah. Uh, how do we ensure that uh, we are not disturbing system Python? Many times have I, when I'm installing in my system, I somehow I, I mess up things. Um, have you watched the previous three, uh, three walkthroughs? Uh, last one I missed. Okay, so watch that. Uh, okay. where we basically answer that question, I believe. But if you have any, if that doesn't answer your question, then please ask next time. Thank you, thank you. No worries. All right, thanks all. Bye. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks thank a lot. You.